so the basic job, did, uh, the basic uh, research did its job. Now we needed to then move on to something more applicable to the industry, commercial lines of barrels, not my smoky joes, and as well try different type of environment and and more in commercial conditions. So we moved on here to try to design a prototype. And at that time, I did not want to test what was already there. I already knew what I wanted in my head, so I, I got approached by uh, Eric Thies at the time, uh, who said, you know what, I don't do lights, but you know, I can help you because I work a lot with LEDs and that technologies. And I said, okay, we need to design a bulb with 60% red, 20 green, 20 blue. Why not 100% red? Think about it. You also have to work in the barn. And there were some signs that 100% red could trigger epileptic episodes in humans. So we did not want to come up with a bulb that would be a problem uh, uh, for your workers. So this one was the first prototype, really, you know, basic prototype, but we wanted to make it fully dimmable, which means we could bring it down to about 5% power without losing any, uh, any, uh, any of the output, and as well have a low cost to uh, retrofit the, uh, that bulb. So, and then we moved to commercial birds at the research level, and then things got weird. Okay, first with one of the first experiment we did, we say, okay, why don't we put now some commercial birds on the floor just to make sure that we don't trigger any cannibalism because I heard a sales rep at an industry meeting telling the audience that red light triggers cannibalism. He was selling a green bulb. Okay, but the thing is, you know, when those kind of do, when those kinds of things, rumors, goes around, sometimes they stick and it's really hard to shake them off. So we decided to try here on floor pens, here under pure red, pure green, or our 60% red bulb. And we used the Lohman uh, LSL light there and we tried to follow some of their uh, recommendation. What happened was a big problem for me. They started laying before we photostimulate them. And as a matter of fact, we already started to have birds popping eggs even before we exposed them to our lights. They were popping eggs. Some of them started at 15 weeks or before. I was like, wow. And by the time they were 18 weeks, when we wanted to photostimulate them, we were already between 25-30% production. So how am I going to evaluate the effect of light spectrum and sexual maturity when they are mature before I even stimulate them? And even before photostimulation, what we noticed is when we exposed the hands under red light, we also again observed that increase in estradiol. So there is still a response from this commercial light, uh, lines towards the uh, red light in, in order to stimulate reproduction. Now, when we look at the overall production, different picture. Lohman bird, they picked at around between 96%, 96-98%, and they stayed stable and they stayed stable all through our experiment. So we were here dealing with a bird that were a Ferrari, I, would call, I call it the Ferrari of the laying world, which is already so high that it's really hard to get some significant or statistically significant increase when you're playing with 40, 50 birds. So those were the kind of things we were uh, facing. However, what we did notice, and uh, as this morning you were talking about, you know, some of the floor eggs and uh, night and day things. One thing that we really noticed that triggered like a really new question for me that hopefully I'll answer over the next 10 years. When the birds that were under green light were desynchronized, they were, they were laying eggs randomly throughout the day and night. And as a matter of fact, almost half of the eggs were laid during the dark time. So normally, and as Kos said this morning, you've got this really well-controlled ovulation cycle where you've got that control of dusk and dawn that will have a, where you have an open for the hands to ovulate an egg. And there are some internal triggers that control that. And it looks like under green light, that control was gone. They were just on free run or free lay, I should say, laying an, an egg randomly without any synchronization and any pattern. Whereas when you had pure red or a white light, the majority of the eggs were laid during, uh, during the normal time. So we also looked at some of the stress and behavior and we did not observe any m major effect on stress and behavior. No cannibalism. We did not see birds depressed. We did not see birds 
uh, overactive or, what's, or, or whatever. So overall, there was no major uh, uh, effect on uh, behavior. We also measured uh, corticosterone as an indicator of stress hormone, and again, we did not see any major increase in corticosterone that would be associated with uh, physiological stress. So then we also decided, all right, let's go back to our cage model because then we can really monitor birds individually and have some better statistical power over it. So we then moved on with three rooms and in this, this time we used our 60% red LED. We used a compact fluorescent and we used an incandescent light and kind of we looked at what was the impact of those three lighting. And again, same thing with those Lohman girls we ended up having them starting to lay before we photostimulate them. They all peaked around 98% and they stayed ob above 90% all the way down to the end of the experiment. So again, really hard to see any true statistically difference in our research setting. Now, going back to that, one question that I asked myself, wow, look at that those girls are still at 90% when it's time to ship them out. Well, look at what we found. When we measured estradiol in those birds, in that Lohman line, we observed a spontaneous second increase in estradiol right around 55 weeks of age. And we've never, that has never been reported before. What does that mean? That means those hens have been heavily selected over the last 10, 15 years for increasing, or for increasing the number of eggs and the length of the laying cycle. And by doing so, they have selected hens that don't molt, per se. They don't lose feather. They don't go through a molt where they stop laying and they start again. But it's almost like spontaneously the ovary, before it gets depleted, recruit a new wave of follicle and is ready to go again and increase the stradiol. That has implication for calcium metabolism, that has implication for synthesis of the egg components. So those Ferraris are actually now being genetically selected to lay for over a year, maybe a year and a half and possibly more without any severe impact on the hand. So the breeders have done an extremely big job. And this is one of my next project. I want to see what causes that? What causes that spontaneous second increase in estradiol? Right, we also measured feed consumption and body weight gain, and what we observe is under the LED red, we were still a little lower in terms of feed consumption as well as body weight. And this is in cages, in individual cages. And that's something we observe in cages, but we did not observe that on the floor. 